The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Welcome to Stock Take. My name's Gore Absodi. Joining me today is Graham Whitcomb. Hey, Graham. Hey, Gore. And with us also is John Addis. Hey, John. Morning, Gore. Now, Graham, we were going to talk about Star. It's been a bit of a bomb. <laughs> um, tell us yeah. about it. Well, what, what's happened over there? How 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 do they report? Is there an opportunity? What's it looking like? Well, yeah, I mean they 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 actually had an okay. If you look at the underlying operations, they're kind of tracking along okay. They had a good recovery uh, this past year, but that's mainly because the previous year was still kind of lingering with COVID, and. Uh, so yeah, all of the numbers were up by about a third this year, uh, with a with a big driver being the hotel and non gaming revenue. That increased a lot because they suddenly were open an extra. Can't remember how long it was, hundred days or something or other. So yeah, they did pretty well uh, in terms of the operations. But yeah, they did write off. I think it was a billion or more. In total, was it even? higher than that i can't quite remember now oh, but wow. uh yeah they they wrote off a ton uh and was that was that off property the, portfolio uh, was that specific to the sydney property were, were there any other properties that were impacted yeah they wrote off some from all of them but okay, the, the bulk of it was from yeah the bulk of it was from the sydney one uh and yeah the, the main reason is because the so it's kind of a double double whammy they were lowering their expectations mm. for future uh income out of it because of the fluctuating tax rates and all of that and then at the same time they were raising the capitalization rate which pulled down the value of those earnings so yeah the the sydney casino lost a billion or something or other from wow. its value and yeah it's, it's, but, but i think that that's probably overdone uh that it wouldn't have actually been that bad because when the books closed that was in June, but it was after June that the government then announced that the taxes were, weren't were anywhere near as bad as they had initially said. Yeah. So, yeah, I suspect that the cash flows will actually come in ahead of what their end of year kind of forecast would have said. Um, yeah. You know, everyone thinks these that casinos are licensed to print money and they probably should be, but Star is one that has just been appallingly run from the very beginning so the, the think about this the when they first built the star casino in sydney they faced it with the back against the water you know they mm -hmm. had to, it took them years to figure out actually we better why don't we face we've got this harbor here why don't we face the water they had to spend hundreds of million dollars redoing that casino to make it face the water which i don't understand why it wasn't doing that in the first place it's arguably in the wrong location to begin with um, it's never really been um, as successful as Crown has. And there's just something about the the management at Star that's always, it, it's never performed as well as you'd expect a, a casino operation to perform. And Can I, um, I don't yeah. have an explanation for that. It, John, you're a frequent visitor. You would um, have some insights. Well, hmm. I think that's probably true what you're saying about Sydney. Um, you might blame the architect. I mean, it's a god awful building. In it, a it is horrible, terrible, yeah. terrible spot. Um, I was going to make the contrary argument that they have learnt their lesson. I went. I was in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, right. Okay. I, I used to go there very frequently, and I've seen that development come up. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's not only is it huge; it's really, really impressive. Right. And they built a bridge from South Bank where everybody tends to go where all the museums and art galleries are, there's a bridge that will funnel people directly into the jaws of this development. Mm, interesting. And <laughs> straight to the gaming tables. Straight <laughs> to the gaming tables. And I, I suspect that, you know, just looking at it from the outside, I've looked at the fly-throughs and all of that kind of stuff. They've, I think they've probably got that development right. Okay. There's a lot of money being spent in Brisbane. They're um, not just on, on the casino there, but on the train system and the highways and... They've got the Olympics in 2032, I think it is. Um, Brisbane was never really an attractive place to go. I remember that they used to say that they'd, they'd land Chinese tourists at the Gold Coast and they'd, they'd at the south end of the Gold Coast at the airport there and they'd point to the big buildings at surface and say, oh, that's Brisbane and never actually take them to Brisbane. 
<laughs> because it didn't really matter. But now I think it will. Brisbane's a far more interesting city than what it was 20 years ago. It's a very much changed place. Mm. And that casino is right there at the center of the development. So I don't know for sure. We'll, we'll have to see. But the, all the mistakes they made in Sydney, I don't think they've repeated those in Brisbane. Yeah, right. Okay. That'd it's be also interesting. interesting. It's also interesting that the, uh, the casinos haven't really been affected too much by all the other access to entertainment that we have these days where people can gamble online. They can like, yeah, play games online. They can do anything from their home, but they still want to go to the casino. There hasn't been a, a big drop off in say casino attendance compared to going to do your shopping in person. Uh, so yeah, there, there's something about casinos that keep pulling people back beyond the, just the gaming. Cause you can get that, in all kinds of forms these days yeah. so yeah I'm when was sure the first results from that casino grain when do when does it start um generating cash flow do you know i think it's supposed to open at the end of this year so we should start oh, to okay. see it pretty soon uh maybe we should do yeah i would expect in the next result i was gonna i was just gonna let's say go that. up to I, brisbane I, and have a look at the from, from i think we casino. might have to we might, we might have to go go up there yeah yeah i, I, I agree and and, and flight center head office. The buffet. <laughs> <laughs> flight center's office is just across the river as well, so you go in and, and meet with those guys. You haven't seen them for a long time. Well, that might be a good idea to do to add in a couple. There are other, a couple of uh, Queensland companies we've spoken about, John, that mm. um, might be worthwhile go visiting them all in the same time. Yeah, power. Yeah, okay. All right, that's a good idea. We'll do train that. ride on Horizon. <laughs> so, Graham, keep an eye on that opening. Um, when you reckon it's ready, let us know. We'll organise a tour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I can that. I just make one point about Star as well after my rant yeah. about Alan Joyce and Qantas last week mm. about how there's kind of a when you've got a very big business that is subject to regulatory oversight and relies a lot on its competitive position for government favor then you're exposing yourself to a risk that is is normally taken for granted but then every now and again the governments or the regulators do something sensible. Um, and often the mm. investment case is predicated on them not doing something sensible. And I mean they and, did something sensible this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And 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 often that that reaction, because they they're so the government or the regulators are a sort of so cowed by the adverse pub publicity they've been getting, they'll, they'll actually react quite strongly. I think we mm. saw that at Star, and then they backed off, of course. And we, mm. we maybe maybe see that with Qantas in the next few months. It's just a risk that investors tend not to pay too much attention to. They just look at the regular. The, they look at the, you know, the revenues coming in, the, the customers that are coming through the doors. But there's there's not normally been a worry until it is, you know, you might go for years and not even think about it. And then something comes out of left field and the regulators do something or well, the government does yeah. something that can really make a big difference to your investment case. It's Particularly with these kind of sin industries where it's an easy sell for the government, yeah. like the government, it would be harder for them to come out and change the, uh, I don't know, taxes or something on a healthcare stock mm, versus totally. Like who's going to complain about raising rates on star? Yeah. Well, a yeah. good example of that is, is yeah. Victoria where you cannot build a new home connected to gas anymore, which just kind of blows huh. my mind actually. Is that right? Yeah. They banned it. Just, just banned it, <laughs> which is just, in, it, it blows my mind. It really does. Cause there, there are a lot of things we cook at home that kind of need gas. The, the electric or induction doesn't do, you can't get, I, i've had yeah. this argument with my brother for a long yeah. time he loves induction and i was staying at his place for about a month over christmas mm. and they've got an induction unit and i'm i'm kind of a fan now yeah well i've had one oh. previously i'm kind of really a fan like my yeah, wife doesn't yeah. like it yeah. yeah yeah it's just getting past the idea of looking at the flame and going, okay that's yeah. right you know when you're doing an egg something my kids can't do because they just turn it up they think all kinds of cooking are best done with the flame at maximum on the biggest <laughs> ring you know whether you're frying an egg or doing a stew yeah you know, i just bang it yeah, up yeah. you know there's no point having a, a button really or a, a, a knob just flame on flame on get it done <laughs> smell the house out with burnt metal yeah mm. um but yeah i think uh i think inductions will eventually replace gas and they probably should and we'll get used to it mm. yeah be nice if that was a choice and not a a forced um, choice, but there you go. 
Um, let's so quickly your, move your on. Rev head speaking there, Gora. <laughs> it's, it's my libertarian <laughs> speak, speaking. <laughs> um, let's and they move... won't take my petrol either. No, I'm, I'm not... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, these electric cars, I really think this is, this is a, a rant, um, but a life cycle emissions um, analysis of EVs versus um, an efficient hybrid or a very efficient small engine. Um, regular conventional ICE car. I mean, a lot of the studies that have happened so far shows that um, there's very little difference. And if anything, the legacy cars are, are more efficient over the lifetime. Um, and, and it's just been lost. This is a so much um, so much unthinking behavior going on. Mm. Mostly all driven by yeah, government. People love to dream. Um, now, thinking of dreaming, um, actually, EVs was the, was the right uh was the right segue because i wanted to have a quick that was chat. a segue there but you yeah missed yeah it, it was <laughs> i just didn't re just didn't re realize at the time if you like the sound of our investing approach and aren't yet a member visit intelligentinvestor.com.au to take us on a free 15-day test drive get immediate access to all our current buy recommendations model portfolios and engaging educational research tailor-made for people that want to manage their own money. That's intelligentinvestor.com.au for a free 15-day trial. No credit card required. I wanted to, to talk about some of these lithium miners. Um, over the last six months or so, I've been doing um, I've been doing a lot of technical work on on lithium and trying to understand the geology and the processing. I think I've I've gotten there. I think I'm pretty comfortable with with that stuff now, and I understand it to a degree where I'm more comfortable with with lithium miners than I was a year ago. Mm. Um, and so I've been paying attention to the results this time, um, being able to un understand them a little bit better. Um, and a few things have become clear. Uh, one is that it is quite hard to set up new supply. This is not like copper or or even even nickel, which um, which are very forgiving commodities, and that you can have a huge variety of of rocks, um, and if you just expose them to chemicals or acid, or a a, a known processing technique, you, you can get the the mineral out of the rock. Um, with, with the nickel, I mean, you can use um, you can use bugs to get the nickel out of the rock. Um, you can use a, a conventional um, uh, a what conventional do you mean, bugs? circuit. Um, you can use um, like little little bugs, like little parasites, um, insects, and uh, uh, bacteria and stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah. They, really? Yeah, they... what, so, what do you do with the once they've eaten all the nickel? What do you do? How do you get it out of the? No, no, no. They eat rock? away the other rock and they leave the um, they leave the nickel bearing ores alone. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 used in Indonesia sometimes. Um, it's science, John. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, the, the, well, the point there is that you can have a wide variety of, of geology and still extract the mineral you're interested in. And it appears to mm -hmm. me that with lithium, it's a, it's a much more limited choice. Um, uh, core lithium is one I've been following very closely because it is the disaster and you learn a lot by following the disasters. Um, so they've had, they instead of having one established homogenous piece of, of rock that they're, that they're digging up and mining, what they've done is they put like a um, a low tech, very simple processing facility up in I think it's the Northern Territory they're in, and and they got a whole bunch of um, very small deposits, and they would gather the rock from all these different deposits into this centralized um, circuit, and they try and process it. And what they realized was that um, you need sort of a uniform rock structure um, to crush grind. And to process, you can't have different types of rocks all going into the same circuits because the the, the lithium bearing rock is a is a crystal structure, and when you have different crystal sizes, you need different processing techniques. And so that business has set up without really understanding um, the processing flow sheet, and I think they're stuffed. Um, and when you compare that to something like a Pilbara, which has this very large homogeneous mine. Um, kind of a, a, a uniform, uniform rocks, uniform crystalline structure. It's taken them a couple of years to, to crack the code for processing, but mm -hmm. as they have, you've just seen profitability soar, 
and it's quite a complex operation, but I think they've, they've worked hard to understand what they have and to process that correctly. And companies that don't do that, that kind of take shortcuts, that try and do it quickly or uh, cheaply are the ones that get into trouble. And a lot of the industry is now trying to bring on lithium supply in a very swift and I think um, unthoughtful sort of way. And it just shows me that there's a lot of value in one of these very large, unique deposits, which um, which, which are quite rare. A, a deposit of Pilbara size is 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 a rarity internationally. I think it's 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 a top four, top five deposit in the world, and it can be immensely profitable. It's going to be hard to harder than I thought to bring on new supply. I think is the is the point. Um, I just think it's, it's going to be much more challenging, and I think existing producers are going to look a lot more interesting. And as a, as an example of that, um, IGO just um, just had a, a cracking slide in their deck. And they just showed the um, the profitability of of their mine. They own twenty five percent of Green Bushes, which is the world's biggest spodge mine, mine with the mine in the world, Hard Rock Mine. And that that mine, that single mine, made ten billion dollars um, in the year. Wow. Which uh, right. and the amazing thing is, they only moved a very small amount of material um, to uh, to make that much money. There are a couple of ten billion dollar mines in the world. So that's due to the purity of the resource, is it? Um, I, I think it's due to the very high price of lithium, mm. and 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 also, yeah, to to the high quality of the resource as well. Um, you know, I just think that it's going to be very hard to bring on um, new mines. Hard, not harder than I initially expected to bring on new resources. And and I think as this lithium price falls and as it becomes um, out of favour, it hasn't happened yet, but it is happening. You can see it happening. Um, I think there might be some opportunities in lithium and it's not going to be in some new deposit or something really exciting. It's going to be um, in something boring and old and that's been producing for a while and that's cracked a, a quite a complex and difficult processing technique. Um, so I think uh, Pilbara looks interesting and I think just... Minrace continues to look interesting. So are you saying the processing techniques will vary from mine to mine? Yeah, yeah, they will. I think they have to. Yeah, there's a couple of choices you have, um, mm -hmm. but um, but unlike say copper with with copper, it's very common to set up your processing facility, and then take ore from all over the place, and centralize um, your processing from that one facility, even mm -hmm. though you're accepting ore from lots of different locations. Right. Nickel, BHP runs its nickel business on that basis. They have a large nickel hub, and they accept nickel ore from all over the region. And then they process it and, and take a, a margin on it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's possible with lithium. Um, and, and I think the reason why is because the rocks are a crystalline structure. It looks as though there's there's a whole lot of technicalities, which are going to bore everyone, but it looks as though that that that's going to be much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that's going to be possible. So these, these very large um, homogenous deposits, I think are going to be incredibly valuable. And um, they're worth looking out for, and and that's the sort of thing that I'm increasingly looking at. It's a it's quite a different model from um, copper and nickel, mm. and then so and I think that's what that's what we've got to get heads around that this is this is a different, well, it, it's different to some traditional metals. Okay, and and what about how common is lithium, and how common are those large homogeneous deposits? Lithium is extremely common. Um, I, the, the, there are two ways to really access, well, there, there are three ways. One, the third way is a bit experimental and they're working on it in China, but um, it's from little pebbles and stuff. But um, the, the two traditional ways are hard rock mining. So you blast, crush and grind rock, which is what we do in WA. Almost all, most of the world's hard rock lithium comes from Australia. And then you've got these brines. So you, you do drill... Um, so the way they form, and they're mostly in South America. So there's a region there at the foot of the Andes Mountains that has 80% of the world's brines or something like that. Mm. And the reason is that um, a lot of minerals have leached from the, from the Andes into underground alpha aquifers. Mm. And as you drill boreholes and access those aquifers, you can then create these very large evaporation ponds. So this lithium-rich, mineral-rich water Wow. is left to evaporate in these big ponds wow. and you're left with a concentrated lithium material which you then process so it's like salt mining 
it is like salt mining. Yes, that's exactly what it's like, except you then have to process um, the compound at the end a little bit further to mm. get um, to get a carbonate. That's incredible. But um, I think that's a really, that doesn't seem to be as profitable as the hard rock mining. Um, mm. And again, there's a whole host of technical reasons why that is. We don't need to get into it now. But we want to, well, the point of this rant is that um, there are specific characteristics that I think are attractive in lithium that we're looking for. And those characteristics, I think, to me anyway, are now becoming clearly defined. And it's a hard rock resource in a safe jurisdiction with a large um, homogenous body with a uniform crystal structure um, and with a processing technique, which I think I understand now. So um, I, I think the the knowledge is now there and and um, we just have to wait for prices, which to be honest, aren't miles away. We're, we're, I'm not really? far off from um, uh, introducing some lithium companies to the buy list. Um, so you heard so. it here, folks. The next coal stocks are coming <laughs> up. <laughs> Right. Should we take um, another break, gents, and then yes. do some thinking aloud? If you enjoy our approach to investing, but don't want to manage your own money, check out Intelligent Investors' range of managed funds, including income, growth, ethical, and international options. Decades of research and experience is distilled into the management of these four managed funds each focused on achieving outsized investment returns. Check out our performance track record, fees, and approach at intelligentinvestor.com.au forward slash funds dash overview. All right, on to our final segment. We call this Thinking Aloud because it is both uh, out loud and are loud <laughs> and thinky <laughs> and thinking yes yeah. we, we smart people good yeah um, <laughs> graham why don't you kick us off so i've got a uh it's not a question from a member but a comment that i quite liked it was on the article uh resmed's interaction with azempic the new weight loss drug and philip o says the suggestion that ResMed's product will no longer be needed because a new speculative drug is going to rid the world of obesity has got to be one of the longest bows I've ever seen drawn. And I say, here, here, Philip, I agree. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I think that the, the rush for Ozempic, uh, well, stocks that are going to either benefit from Ozempic or that are going to be damaged by it is um, really overblown at the moment. That even if you consider that this, drug does help people lose weight that the kind of fever around it is probably overblown and i suspect that weight issues will always be something that humans have to deal with because if you start taking a zempic it'll probably mean that you were more willing to eat the cake <laughs> that we kind of we balance them out so i, I actually disagree yeah. with that grim i think this is ah. a, i think this is a proper society changing event and I, and I think really? I, I think in twenty years' time, if you're if you're wealthy, if you have money, then you 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 won't have um, you, obesity among the rich class anymore. This is going to be like um, uh, you know what's that um, uh, the time machine where the the Morlocks live underground and the uh, and the humans live above ground. It's going to be the yeah, rich. It'll people. be the fatties and the skinnies. It's going to be the fatties <laughs> and the skinnies. I, I really think so. I I, I, th I think this is going to be a, a society changing event. Ozempic, um, I know so many people, you can see it. You, you walk down the streets and you can see it. I know people have lost weight just dramatically. But, but the rich thing. people aren't, tend not to be overweight. Like it's it's not. Yeah, the I'd say there's a, lots of other factors. Mm. I can see how the insurers are going to push it. because Not it obese, might... but overweight, yes. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can see it having mm. an effect on society. Why but... wouldn't you take it? I mean, if you, if you the parallel I would draw is with... Um, antibiotics you know and antibiotics just 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 killed bacterial infection uh it's well it's but they're really that, that's, there's the no degrees in that and... yeah they've adapted but that's not going to happen with yeah. this i'm saying that that um the, but that i think a, people a new technology hmm. yeah i think that the, the mentality will be that people will just say well yeah. i'm taking this drug now so i can basically eat what i want but the way that's it works, exactly what i think that's how i yeah. would do it if yeah. i was taking it i would 
instantly be like, oh, great, I don't have to watch what I eat anymore. Yeah, but so the way it works, that might be true. It offsets every day. the benefit. No, no, that's not the way it works, guys. The way it works is it kills your appetite. You just, you just cannot eat the quantities you want. If you sat there and ate, ate cake all day, you'd still be limited in your calories because you couldn't consume as much cake because you're... That's the way the drug works. It messes with your appetite impulse. Um, so I, I it still I, only even, reduces weight by ten percent or so, though. So ten to fifteen. I think that's it. Yeah, it, it can, it can be up to thirty thirty percent. Um, like it, and and this is the the this, it's going to get better and stronger, and it's only mm -hmm. time before it starts becoming an an oral pill. Um, I think um, once it's a pill, once you can take a pill and and not get fat. There's a reason why that that business is now the company that makes Ozempic is now the most valuable firm in Europe, and um, and I agree with that. I think it's it's uh, everyone's going to be on it, or some form of it. I don't know. There's there's lots of people that don't like drugs. There's lots of people that don't take all kinds of uh, things that are that might be to their benefit. Like I I I can fully see the argument of why people might want to take Ozempic, but. Uh, but I think there's going to be there's still a big group of the population that are not going to want it, or that are going to offset its benefits by overdoing what they enjoy. Oh, so naive, Graham. I think when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to um, human behavior, the um, you know I've once heard uh, an investor saying that I focus my attention on the seven deadly sins. He says if you mm. can find a company that indulges in any of them you know, gluttony, vanity, um, any sort of, any of those emotions, um, that's your way to riches. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. People's um, behavior um, can be different and it can be nuanced, but when it comes to vanity, when it comes to certain um, attributes, it is uniform and universal. And there's no person on the planet who given a choice to take this pill and, and be thin or otherwise you're on your own and, and you might be fat. There's no one on this planet who's not going to take that pill. I, I, I think it's going to be ninety percent versus ten percent. That's the kind of range we're talking about. Yeah, I'd be but, very I mean, surprised if it doesn't have a big impact. How governments are going to pay for this to pay for everybody? That, that's going to be the limitation, be... actually. the The supply and the cost is going to be the limits. Mm. Um, you know, is it? Yeah, going it'll to be interesting be... to see when it's a generic. What happens when they're oh, yeah, sold yeah. as a cheap yeah. generic versus as a super expensive treatment? When does that yeah. kick in? Is that how long does the patent last for? They're usually twenty years. Hmm. By yeah. which time they'll make some kind of small <laughs> modification to it, and you'll be able to lose twenty percent rather than fifteen, and it's a new drug. Yeah, <laughs> twenty years on it. Hmm. Yeah, so you end up always spending <laughs> the higher price. Yeah. What do you think, John? It'd be <laughs> what on what's my thinking allowed? No, no. What or... do you think about um uh Bazimpic? Um, I'm still going to buy Resmed. <laughs> yeah I, well, I think they're two different i think they're two different yeah they're two um, different cases, cases yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think the reason why resume yeah. is cheap because people think they are the same thing but yeah. they're actually different and that's why it's cheap so yeah um i don't know if if what you say is true that you just don't have the appetite i don't know whether appetite is what drives my unhealthy eating habits i think it's flavor mm. and whether i'm hungry or not i could easily eat a bar of chocolate no trouble mm. whatsoever. I think a lot of people are probably like me. So I'd probably go with Graham's side of the argument rather than yours. Uh, but look, we don't know, do we? We're going to find out. I wonder what this does. Maybe to... it cuts your craving. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's, well, that's what we this need. Is, it might cut the craving, but I definitely know that if there's a plate of chips in front of me, I'm going to keep eating those chips long after I'm full <laughs> yeah. uh, and then feel bad about myself after. So. Yeah. If that just cuts out the craving or it cuts out the appetite, I'm still going to eat. Yeah, you know, what's tasty? That's another. That's another, you're you're a, a a smart, um, disciplined, intelligent person, Graham. And yet, um, when gluttony gets involved, all that goes thrown out the window. I just think there's there's a lot there. Yeah, John, I know you love branding. I mean, what is branding other than trying to turn or marketing other than trying to turn a rational, thoughtful individual into a, a mm. mindless zombie of of spending and consumerism, right? How do you convince someone? Oh, to I think spend you're starting 10, from the wrong place, days? assuming that most people are rational, thoughtful individuals. <laughs> like yeah, if they were, value investing wouldn't work. Uh, now, branding is a lot more. I think branding, branding homes in on our innate psychological weaknesses, mm -hmm. and it plays with those. 
uh, it doesn't circumvent our rationality. It just goes straight to the heart of who we are, which is fundamentally emotional human beings rather than rational decision makers. Yeah. So I think, and I think, I think they play, brands play into, like you said, Gaurav, with the the seven deadly sins, but yeah. the brands are usually trying to pick up on one of those of look how yeah. sexy you'll be if you have this, look how tasty this will be if you, yeah. Mm. Or, 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 they'll, or they'll uh, absolutely invert it. So if you look at, say, Magnums, the way they're marketed as an indulgence, mm. a lot of products are marketed yeah. as, as like a, they are a deadly sin, but they're a really good deadly sin. And you know they're unhealthy for you, but just do it. Yeah. You know, like a lot yeah. of fast food advertising is like that. It's kind of, you know, you can do this, you can become this radical, you can have this radical act by consuming a burger that's got 3,000 calories in it. Yeah, there's a burger chain here actually that I love, one of my favorites, which is called Fat Burger. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, there we go. Perfect. And all their all Perfect. their ads are just like dripping with grease and everything, and that just makes me slobber a little bit. So <laughs> I think it works. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, one day I would love to to set up a, a fund that just focus on on the seven deadly sins, um, mm. the devil's fund yeah. or something like that. Right? I just think it's good. So it's <laughs> yeah. a recipe to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Throw in some casinos, and you're good. <laughs> if Ron's listening, maybe that's his idea for next the next fund. <laughs> the next fund, the yeah. II Sin Fund, the yeah. unethical yeah. intelligent investors pool. Hey, um, yeah, uh, John, um, you're thinking aloud. Well, this was something that we were speaking about yesterday. We were just having a random conversation and talking mm -hmm. about blow ups. And over the history of intelligent investor, obviously, we've had a great many blow ups. If you look at our long term track record, we've been far better at picking good businesses at fair prices rather than not so good businesses at cheap prices i would say mm. um and i suppose the recent blowups that we've had haven't necessarily been great businesses have been good businesses at cheap prices but they've probably been probably poorer businesses than we thought at reasonably high prices maybe and we were just discussing how to handle that psychologically and you made the comment that I just don't bother thinking about them anymore. And I think that's kind of true. I'm a little bit like that now. If I lose money, I just move straight on from it. And mm. the premise of that, without really thinking about it, is that I go into it with the idea that I'm going to lose money. So when I do, I'm not surprised. You can just move on from it. There's this idea invest in investing that you should always reflect on your on your losers, on your your bad experiences, because that helps you improve. But hopefully you get to a stage where you can just kind of put them in the box and say oh yeah that was that mistake and just move on for them rather than agonize over them and be drawn into this sort of self-analysis and self-doubt which i think undermines almost everything so being able to pigeonhole your losses and put them in the box and say that was that and then just move on to the next one i think is a really good thing yeah i think part of that um is recognizing the role of luck chance variability in the outcome mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm, that works true. on the upside and on the downside. Yeah. Um, and some blow ups, you know, I'm not trying to make excuses for, for, for some of them are a result of poor analysis and poor choices, but some of them are just um, random choices that just don't work out. And that happens sometimes. And um, I, I lost a, um, uh, there, there were probably two companies recently I've lost um, a decent chunk on. One was Money Me, yeah. which I think from, from my point of view was, didn't understand that business, didn't understand the risks or the balance sheet analysis necessary for my, myself mm -hmm. um, and misallocated um, and, and lost more than I needed to on that. And yeah. the other one um, was, was Dubber, which I owned for a short time. And I think when I bought that, it was probably a reasonable case to buy it. And, and, I, and I sold it very intelligently, I, I think, as well. When the red flags popped up, I sold it straight away. Um, but And I still lost... A decent amount of money on it but i never went back and thought oh no what did i do wrong there um you know what what how can i do that better next time it was a speculative stock i bought that did not work out i just think that happens sometimes yeah, and that's right you, what a luck, surprise luck, yeah what a surprise yeah um, um i mean the coal thing is, is similar as well i mean it made a, a a huge windfall on the coal stocks um I, I didn't look back and think oh geez i did that really well or nailed that mm -hmm got very lucky that russia decided to invade ukraine you know um, right. mm. um there's a lot of a lot of luck involved with that as well and I, I didn't feel the highs of that and i didn't feel the pangs and lows of of, of dabo or, or money me i just think we gotta we gotta get used to this idea that that random variation 
luck plays a big role in the outcomes here and can't get carried away with emotions up and down. I would say that, you know, that, yeah, I agree. Uh, is it that Rudyard Kipling thing where you, he says that you, you approach success with the same mentality as you do failure? Oh, I liked, I haven't heard that. Okay. Right. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe a subscriber or member can correct that for me, but, mm. but I, I think that kind of captures it. You know, right. if you're kind of ambivalent about the outcome, you don't, mm. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't persecute yourself. And I think that helps to make better decisions when you come yes. to the next one. Yes. I think as I, as I get older, the the more I realize that this game is, you need a certain amount of analytical nous, and, and you get that pretty quickly. It's not really the hard part. Mm. After that, it's just making good decisions. And yeah. so you've got to put yourself in situations where you can make good, sensible decisions. And that means not getting too elated where you get, um, I think, uh, hubristic and also not getting too down on yourself where you're just too afraid yeah. to make decisions at all. Just with Money Me and Graham, you, you're on top of this as well, but have you had a, it's interesting to know whether any of us has gone back to it because no, the I know. share I've been price has been absolutely <laughs> yeah. hammered. Yeah. The branding's still there. The money's still coming in. <laughs> what do you think? What, what do you think of that situation now? Sorry, whether anything has what? What was the... Yeah, just that the, the the share price at Money Me has obviously been hammered. It seems to me yeah. as though the business is still functioning in a reasonably well. The they're, they're now manner. making decent profit the, because yeah. they've stopped writing new business. Yeah, the profitability is it's, it's a long but runoff yeah. situation. Now, yeah, it could be a yeah, yeah. Yeah, this was a good example of like we were talking earlier about uh, how the share price can impact your uh, psychology because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of every step of the way on the way down, I thought the share price was overdone. Hmm. The, the the losses were overdone. And uh, eventually, once you're down like 95% or something, you start yeah. thinking, well, maybe I wasn't <laughs> right up at the top. No, I'll just wait for that other 5% so, to disappear before yeah, I, I mean, confirmation. Will I take it to zero before I think that I made a, made a mistake? <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I mean, I... I clearly got it wrong with money me, but it's still hard for me to not look at it and be like, well, this is just cheap. Um, mm-hmm. And I kind of, I've, I don't own it anymore myself. And I yeah, don't, don't even read its stuff anymore because it was a painful loss. Uh, but yeah, I mean, once bitten twice shy, I guess, but it doesn't look, yeah, it always looked like it was going to do better than it did, I guess. That's one of the, we've got to wrap up soon, boys, but um, that's actually one of the hardest things to do is when you've lost serious amounts of money and then to go back and look at the stock. I yep. still find that um, I've done yeah, that once. Yeah, you get burned. <laughs> it's really hard. It is really hard because you, if you get, if you lose money twice on the same stock, <laughs> that, yeah. that has got to be the most painful thing. There's a great uh, quote uh, in Brazil, which is a, a dog bitten by a snake is afraid of sausages. <laughs> and yeah, I, I feel that that's a very true statement. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's that's a great way to finish, I think, actually. Um, dog, love, it, just, love it, Graham. Just before we go, uh, just yep. to remind members that we do have a webinar coming up a week tomorrow. So that's mm-hmm. on Thursday at midday where we're just going to do a reporting season wrap, take some questions. It's going to be live. Is it an experiment? I suppose it is. Uh, conversation probably not too dissimilar to this one, but maybe with some different stocks and more stock focus. So if you're interested in that, you'll be getting an email on that shortly if you haven't already. And just register online, part of your membership, no cost. See you there. All right. Are we, and we're doing that, aren't we, John? Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> I tried to organize that with you yesterday. And yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Good. Good. Yeah, just, just confirming for the with of... Gaurav. Nobody's okay. heard from him, but he's, yes, he's going to be there. You'll get the email too, Gaurav. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm notoriously disorganized. Um, so, yes, we yeah. guys have to be extra extra gentle. All right. Um, appreciate that. Um, Graham, thanks very much for your time today. Thanks, Gaurav. John, a pleasure as always. No, it's great. Thank you. And for everyone else, thank you for listening.